understand who, if any, are the developmental coaches on that staff. And so I kind of wanted to give a, a Packers history of kind of how we got here. You know, when Aaron Rodgers is going to leave, you're going to have this first time in 30 years, you're not going to have a Hall of Fame quarterback, we don't think, and what that looks like right now. So you remember when Matt LaFleur got hired, Matt LaFleur had spent time, and I think this was really in the in the moment where if you had had a cup of coffee with Sean McVay at some point, you were going to get you were going to get serious consideration. Um, that wasn't necessarily why people got hired, but you know, let's face facts as far as the the number of people that were coming off of not necessarily even his staff, but but had been in a building with him at some point. Owners were super excited because Sean was and Sean is he's an absolute unicorn to be the, as young as he was when he got hired with his, with his IQ, his football intelligence, his emotional IQ, his leadership abilities, he's very, very rare. And so I think a lot of people were trying to strike, you know, lightning in a bottle twice, but he had spent time with, with not only Sean McVay, but, but Mike Shanahan, he had had one season calling plays, I think for the Tennessee Titans before he came into Green Bay. So very young, inexperienced play caller, did have a season under his belt, but inexperienced play caller. Um, if you remember, if you're a Packers fan, you'll remember that there was a lot of questions at, when he got hired because he was hired darn near on the spot. Usually you go through rounds of interviews and it seemed like he got, I think he might, he must've crushed it at his one interview. And then he was almost hired before they started bringing in some other, other people. He didn't have a second interview. He didn't go around the building and start, you know, traditionally you go around the building and you start you know, meeting the, the equipment guys and, and meeting the, everybody that's on staff now and meeting the strength coaches, et cetera. But I don't, I don't believe any of that happened. I think, I believe it, it was first interview and they, they hired him pretty quickly thereafter. And then you remember, you know, obviously when that happens, the question is, especially with a veteran quarterback who probably knows more about football at this stage than any young head, new head, first time head coach they're going to bring in. Who is going to be the counterbalance to the, your youth and your exuberance, you know, has, who has a little bit of experience um, in that in the building? And so you remember Sean McVay brought in Wade Phillips, who at the time, was, I think he was damn near 80 years old. But it was a great counterbalance to his youth. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, I think Tom Clements was an older gentleman at the time. I know he's been – I know he left and now he's back again, but I think he was the quarterback's coach. And I don't remember how old he was when he got drafted, but if you look at the staff – you know, kind of an older gentleman that probably helps in meeting rooms, helps to just have somebody there who, you know, it, it can, can be collecting retirement. Let's call it what it is if they want to be at that point. I just think that's a very calming thing. So Matt comes in, his original uh, defensive coordinator was Mike Petton, who was left over from the McCarthy staff, which in itself was kind of odd. Now you can probably say, Look, the, the defense had been doing okay. That he's probably doing that to maintain some continuity, but it was it was a little bit odd to not, um, given how that they weren't like a top five defense at the time. It was it kind of an issue move. Uh, the original special teams coordinator was Sean Meninga. Um, I think he was from Jacksonville, and then Nathaniel Hackett was the original OC. And remember, Matt calls plays, so you kind of have to figure out what your OC does. And, and you you kind of recall, as opposed to like Andy Reid and the Chiefs, Eric Bieniemy is the one kind of relaying all the information on the sideline. We didn't necessarily see that um, in this case. Not that that's the way to do it. It's just there are some different ways. So you kind of have to figure out what Nathaniel Hackett does in the moment because he's not necessarily calling plays even though he's the offensive coordinator. So there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that that, that, that that person does. But I also think that probably retracts or detracts, excuse me, from that person's authority. Like if you're not calling the plays and even at the OC, then you're not really the guy. And so you kind of wonder how all this stuff happens. Now, obviously Mike Penton underperformed. Um, Sean Meninga underperformed. And so in 2020, they got rid of both those guys. And for special teams, they just promoted in-house. They, they brought uh, Maurice Drayton. They hired him to be the special teams coordinator, who was who was an assistant in Menega. And, you know, at that point, you're essentially saying what? You're essentially saying, we've got the guys, we have the system. And there was something that Menega was doing and the way he ran meetings, or because or, you're not really calling that much crazy stuff. 
the way you, the way that you're running means or practices is wrong is is the reason that we're not having success um it's in, like that's always interesting like that person in front of you is not moving up to become a like moving to another team to elevate their status like to becoming a you know coordinator to a head coach uh, an assistant to a coordinator etc if that's not happening if you're doing it because it's a performance issue which you think is the guy the only question you can ask and i don't I don't know enough about the situation, but just generally speaking, the only question you can ask is what habits did uh, Meninga pass on to Morris Drayton that are going to be detrimental to, to the team developing in the special teams area? And as it turns out, they, Drayton didn't do a great job, and, and now we have Rich Passaccia. And, you know, last year, before Keyshawn Nixon became Keyshawn Nixon with our team. And it took, you know, because I actually had him on, on his on his team in in, uh, in Las Vegas. I think he's been in the league for three years before he kind of had this breakout performance. And he, it wasn't like he was a, a, a rocket ship there. And all of a sudden we just decided not to play him here. And we had obviously, we had, we had drafted the kid out of Clemson a couple of years ago. And so we were giving him a chance, but you know, Versace's special teams in Green Bay were bottom five until Keyshawn Nixon got in the game. And all of a sudden we got down to 21, 22, something like that. So we're just right around average. And Versace is probably the best coordinator on the team right now. But you wonder, uh, when we talk about development, you just very, wonder very simply if he's the best guy on the team and, he, and, and all these great things happened when, in Las Vegas when he became interim head coach, everybody thinks a lot of him. Then you wonder that, okay, what else could it be that we're not as good as we maybe should be in that position? Is it it just takes some time. Is it that he doesn't get the the sometimes in the special at the special teams position you don't get the um, time or respect from the rest you know the offensive defensive parts of the of the building and so maybe your your practice time or your meeting time or you know whatever it is eats into it. Maybe defensive coordinator and I'm not saying this is happening, but maybe you know you can see where you know, maybe some of the, the top safeties and linebackers, so they're pulling them out. Hey, you can't play special teams, even though maybe they should be playing special teams. Um, so there's a lot of different things that go into special teams because you, a lot of times you got four core guys that only play special teams and everybody else is kind of, you're taken from offense and defense. So there's a bunch of things you can go there. And you know, certainly besides it looks like, you know, he's got a great track record and, and people seem to certainly think he's a great coach. The other hire was they hired uh, Drew Petty. And there was a relationship there between uh, Matt and, and Joe Barry, and and uh, he was the Rams linebacker coach under John McVay. So there there is a relationship there. Now it's that uh, that defense is severely underperformed, and I think if you're a fan, if you're a cynic, you're going to say, "Well, I can't believe he's still here." If you're a fan, you're going to look back and go, well, they did good against that Vikings team and they played a little bit better towards the end of the season. Maybe they're going to, you know, maybe there some things are going to change and we're going to be headed in the right direction. Next year, there'll be that top five defense that certainly they've drafted in a top five way as far as the talent they have on the field. And some free agent moves, obviously, with, with uh, guys like Devontae Campbell. But... At the end of the season, when they start talking about, are we going to make any changes in the coaching staff? Are we making coordinator changes? I, everybody's talking about the defensive coordinator position. Matt says, absolutely not. Um, you have to wonder what the priority is. And this is kind of goes back to the earlier talk is, you know, what is the priority when we're hiring certain people? Is it to develop these guys? Is it to be a good soldier in the LaFleur army as far as the staff? Is it to, I mean, it's probably to do all the above, right? But like, what, what is the priority? The other thing that happened last year that kind of go, go, might go unnoticed for some is that Adam Stenovich, who I thought did a phenomenal job the two years prior in the offensive line room and what he did, especially with some of the younger guys and some, some people having to play because of injury, he gets promoted because Nathaniel Hackett takes the, the job in – Denver, he gets promoted from offensive line coach, offensive coordinator, because Hackett's going to take Steno and give him a promotion. And that's the only way that he's allowed to 
leave the Packers is if you offer him a promotion. So they promote him to offensive coordinator. And the issue, if there is an issue, is it's kind of an undefined position with coordinator. Again, you, you're doing a ton of stuff behind the scenes, but now you're not in direct control of, of the, the five out of 11 people that are on the field all the time. So you're losing what I think is probably your best resource on the offensive side of the balls from a coaching perspective. You're losing your best assistant coach in Steno because he's no longer going to be part of the offensive line room, at least on a consistent basis. So they're losing that voice. They're losing that attention to detail. They're losing the way he goes through practice. You aren't necessarily gaining, at least it didn't appear that you're gaining that much innovation or kind of way we do business by putting Stano at offensive coordinator as opposed to Nathaniel Hackett. Because, again, Matt LaFleur, this is his offense. This is the offense that he calls. So I think there's, a again, a, a limited amount of – even if they're drawing everything up because because Matt's so busy, just you know understanding how Mike Holmgren used to do this, just the interaction between all those coaches – you know, ultimately, there's going to be plays in the game that, you know, at that time probably Aaron wanted, but plays that Matt wants and is going to call. So it's like you're not really taking over the offense. Like the changes aren't going to be that severe. And you probably don't want to be that severe because you've been 13 three, three, three years in a row. And, you know, obviously there's you've had success and Aaron's playing at an extremely high level. So all of that makes sense. Um, but you do lose – arguably your best position coach and all the development that went on in that room to a new guy first year as a, as a, the, the, the guy in the room, Luke Buckus and Luke's been around the block. Listen, I know Luke was in Illinois. I know Luke was in Jacksonville years ago. I think he might've been in Pittsburgh as, a, as, a, as an assistant, but it's different. It's certainly different. The way they go about business is different. And I don't know if Sinos, I, I think, you know, sources told me that, he didn't spend that much time on the field with those guys because he doesn't want to probably step on toes, which makes sense. But they certainly didn't perform at the level they did the year before. Part of that's probably personnel, but a couple guys that were there kind of both years took a step back. So you have to start going, all right, are we doing everything we can from a development standpoint for those guys? And again, you, you look at this from a fan's perspective, but then look at it from the player's perspective. You take out a, a probably the argument, the best, coach in the building from an, a development standpoint and you put in anybody else, the team, the players are going to go, well, wait a second. How is this good for my career? And those guys have careers too. And everybody has to consider that, but you just have to make sure that the person you bring in is, is at least as good, if not better than the person that's leading. And so we just always have to make sure that's the case. So I hope that answers your questions on, on Green Bay. The bottom line is I don't, if you're saying who, who are the great development coaches, well, I, the only one I know that certainly is is the offensive coordinator right now. And he's, so he's not really developing anybody because he's not a guy who's going to work closely, I think, with the quarterback because he's not a quarterback's coach. You know, he's not Nathaniel Hackett, Luke Getze, like those those guys. And obviously the other, the other elf in the room is that you know, when Adam Gase went to Denver as a quarterback's coach for Peyton Manning, I, you know, I know Adam. Adam was like, what am I going to teach, you? you know, Peyton Manning? There's a lot of work that he learned how to – he learned a lot from Peyton Manning. He learned how to work and, and how to make sure that he was prepared. But as far as, like, what value are you going to give up uh, 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 Aaron Rodgers when he's in year 15 or 16? Like, how much are you going to teach that guy when he knows the offense better than anybody on the planet? Um that's tough, right? And we had the same situation when I was in Green Bay with Daryl Bevel. Daryl Bevel was a young, young coach, came in, and all of a sudden he's a quarterback coach for Brett Favre. And we all respected Bev because he works hard and everything, but in the back of your mind, he turned, you know, he's had a good career in the National Football League. And in the back of your mind, though, you at that age, you go, well, you just, it, it's kind of, you got to squint your eyes. It's kind of hard to imagine what that's supposed to look like what do you what value are you really adding you can do you could be a horsepower guy like i can put together clips i can you know i can tell you to turn to page six or you know okay i put film together or whatever but as far as coaching a legend 
there's only a few people on the planet that are probably capable of doing that. And so like to have to find one of those guys is, is probably pretty hard unless you have one of the very, very rare commodities of legendary player that is just begging to get coached and coached hard. Like I remember, and I'm not, I'm not in that status at all, but my second or third year in Carolina, we got a new line coach and all I asked him when we had a, a meeting, Dave Magazine, he, he passed away last year, unfortunately. But all I asked at the meeting was like, I need to be coached. You know, and I, at this point, I'd been, I'd had some postseason accolades. I'd, you know, made some good money and everything. I was, I was a good player in the league. But some guy, you, you want to be coached. But I knew that Mags had been around a lot longer than I had. And so that's sometimes the problem with the relationship, particularly with these quarterbacks who've been around forever. And, you know, it's like, it's almost like dog years with these guys as far as how high their football IQ is. 